quickly at the idea of virtue and intention, the first factors of the Norway Plan. And now we are really coming back to the uh, last three factors, which are uh, equivalent to right effort, uh, right meditation, and also right samma, samadhi. And uh, uh, so we have, so we're going to now look at the, uh, this from the point of view of the Savasama Sutta, which starts off by the defilements that are to be given up by seeing here. Yeah. And so this gets quite, uh, I think, quite interesting. This is a bit different from what we normally do when we do the suttas. And, um, and uh, it's going to be really about how to use the idea of non-self in Buddhism. Yeah, this very profound idea, anatta non-self, uh, how to use that in a way which actually uh, is positive for our practice. And also seeing how it kind of culminates yeah, in the profound insight, which is a uh, stream entry as well. We're going to look at these, these specific factors. So, so um, let's see what the Buddha has to say about this. So we have now come to the uh, coming to the first paragraph here. And uh, this is what the Buddha says. What are the defilements that should be given up by seeing? Take an uneducated, ordinary person uh, who has not seen the noble ones uh, and is neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of the noble ones, uh, and have not seen good persons, uh, and are neither skilled nor trained in the teachings of good persons. Uh, they don't understand uh, to which things they should pay attention uh, and to which things they should not pay attention. Uh, so they pay attention to things they shouldn't uh, and don't pay attention to things they should. So there you are, that's problematic, yeah? If you pay attention to the, the wrong things and you don't pay attention to the right things, then you have a problem. And that problem is basically that your unwholesome qualities are going to grow and the wholesome qualities are going to decline. And of course, this is moving away from happiness, it's moving towards suffering, away from Nibbana and all of these things. So it is really problematic, yeah? And then you will notice here that um, and this starts off by talking about the uneducated ordinary person. In the Pali, this is the Asuttava Putujana. Asuttava means someone who has not heard, yeah, who hasn't heard the teachings of the Buddha, basically. So someone who is not uh, educated in the teachings of the Buddha, yeah, that's, that's really what it means. So, and the ordinary person, Putujana, refers to the kind of the, the regular people in the world. In other words, not the areas, not the noble ones. So there's always a contrast in the suttas between the noble ones on the one hand and then the ordinary people on the other hand. Yes, these two qualities kind of go together. The most uh, person who has no idea at all has neither any education about the teachings nor do they have any insight. And this is the kind of person we're talking about here. And on the other hand, we have the noble ones who have the full insight. It's like two extremes. And most of us, we are somewhere in between. Yeah, we may not be noble ones, but we have some education in this teaching. So we're somewhere kind of in between these two extremes. Um, then, and who is neither skilled nor trained in the teachings of the noble ones, skilled here, a covido, it means like you have again, no understanding of the teachings. Uh, this is like the initial understanding that you have. Uh, and not trained in the teaching means that you haven't practiced them. Yeah? So again, you have someone who has no understanding, uh, but also no training. So you're missing everything in a sense from Buddhism. Ideally, if you are a really the right kind of person, then you are both skilled, you have the knowledge, and you also have the training, the practice to go with that knowledge. So, um, so, so this talks about the people who don't know anything really about Buddhism. That's the point. If you have no idea, if you have no clue, if you're utterly ignorant and deluded, and you don't know what's going on, then that is the kind of person we're talking about here. And then it talks about the good persons, they have not seen the good person. These are the uh, sapurisa. These are like, the, if you like, the superior people. And this is just a synonym in the suttas for the Aryas. Yeah? If you are a superior person, that is exactly what an Arya is. They are superior because their knowledge is superior, because they 
their understanding is superior and they, they know what is going on there. So you have, a, and, and the suttas are often like this, the same the same thing twice, yeah, areas and then superior people, just to make a very clear statement. And because you have no idea what is going on, then you don't understand which things you should pay attention to and to which things you should not pay attention, yeah, because you have no clue, you have no, uh, you haven't heard the word of the Buddha, you haven't uh, contemplated it. Uh, and uh, what is interesting about this, it shows the importance of the Buddha of these teachings. Yeah? If you don't have any, not, not, this is not really about insight into the teaching. This is about a lack of knowledge, yeah? a lack of confidence and faith in these teachings. Uh, and if you haven't got any of that, any confidence and faith, uh, then you have a real problem because you don't have anywhere to start. Uh, and this kind of person, almost in all circumstances, you tend to pay attention in the wrong way and not pay attention in the right way, especially when it comes to the profound things. Things. The simple things in life, even ordinary people can understand that you have the simple things in life, like, like being moral, you can find people who are moral in all kinds of traditions. Uh, you don't even have to be religious. You can be an atheist or an agnostic and you can still live a moral life because if you are wise about these things, you will understand the importance of morality. You don't really need the noble ones to understand that. Um, and when it comes to meditation, and giving up the external world to focus on the inner world, then still there are some people who do this, even though they're outside of Buddhism. But when it comes to the really core things, yeah, when, we, when we talk about the core things that the Buddhist teaching is about, what we're really talking about is non-self. And this idea of non-self, giving up this sense of identity of me, what I am, of holding on to the things of the world, yeah, this is really where you only get that from the noble ones. And you will always have wrong attention unless you get to hear, hear these teachings uh, from somebody like the Buddha or someone who has heard the teachings from the Buddha. Yeah, this is uh, so, such a fundamental way of thinking in Buddhism. And you, you can see this in many places in the suttas where the spiritual path, it always it starts with hearing the teaching of the Buddha. It starts always hearing it from someone who understands those teachings and yeah it starts with hearing the real dhamma then when you hear the real dhamma then you get faith and from that faith you start paying proper attention but until then you are really lost you're walking around in the darkness you're deluded about the nature of reality and this shows you that in buddhism we don't really talk about the bodhisattva path because the bodhisattva path is about practicing and and gaining you know all of these insights without a help from a buddha yeah so this is obviously not about the bodhisattva path uh, in the arahant path you actually need someone to guide you otherwise there's nowhere to get started here yeah. so in the early suttas there is no bodhisattva path it all starts with the buddha the buddha teaching you then you practice uh, and uh, I think the reason why there is no bodhisattva path in the suttas is because there actually there is no bodhisattva path. Bodhisattvas or Buddhas, they arise more or less by accident. Uh, yeah? There is a person with a lot of wisdom, they find the right teachers, they practice in the right way. And then through that samadhi that they attain, they are able to make a breakthrough and understand reality. But it's not a specific path, it is just the various factors somehow coming together more or less by accident, that's when you have a Buddha. There is no, nothing in the suttas about uh, there being a bodhisattva path. That's a later development, a development that happened maybe a few hundred years after the Buddha's passing away. And, uh, but it's not actually how the Buddha taught these things. Uh, so this shows us the importance of the Buddha, of the noble ones, of the superior people. They are only then can we attend rightly. And if you cannot attend rightly, if you cannot attain with wisdom or properly, of course, you can never make the breakthrough. You can never understand these teachings for what they are. Attending wisely is a very broad. Yeah? It starts from the very early on with understanding morality and going into meditation, but ultimately, it is about attending rightly in terms of wisdom, in terms of understanding 
the problem with the idea I am, the underlying conceit I am, yeah, the, it's called the Asmi Mala in the Sutta, so the conceit I am, uh, that is really what we're talking about now. So now, now we're getting into the profound parts of this Buddhist So I hope you are excited about this because uh, this is really the things that makes the Buddhist teachings uh, so special and so interesting, yeah? So, um, Okay, so it's very possible to have the same answer. And uh, what are the things uh, to which they pay attention but should not? Uh, they are the things that, when attention is paid to them, uh, give rise to unarisen defilements uh, and make arisen defilements grow. That is uh, the defilements of sensual desire, desire to be reborn uh, and ignorance. These are the things to which they pay attention, but should not. And this gives you a nice idea of, of, of what these things are. So when you pay attention to certain things, and if the defilements, these are, this is here translation of the asavas, if these asavas arise, if the defilements in your mind become strong, or they arise or they become stronger, then you know you are paying attention in the wrong way. So if you can see that your attachment to the worldly things uh, or your desire for the worldly things become more powerful, you know that you are actually attending in the wrong way. Uh, yeah, this is how you this is how you have to know that. And then you have to ask yourself, how can I attend differently? What should I do differently here? Uh, this is how we move from attending unwisely to attending wisely. Uh, or the desire to be reborn, or you can say here, your desire to exist, this could be your sense of ego, your sense of self is very strong, and yeah, you really delight in existence, you delight in being the doer in the world, the one who kind of, the agent of all kinds of things. And in this sense, uh, you can know if that is increasing, again, you have a problem. And the last one is ignorance, and that is kind of more, Difficult. I mentioned this before. We were talking about very briefly yesterday about what is really ignorance in this case, the avij asava. And uh, I, I don't know if it is really anything apart from the two other ones. The two other ones, the defilement of sensual desire and the defilement to be reborn, they are quite all encompassing. On the one hand, they're talking about the sensual pleasures of the world. Of the, world. The, other, the other part, that desire reborn, has to do with the sense of I. And these two things are pretty, are pretty broad. And they really take into account most of the problems uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, but um, ignorance can maybe here be understood to be um, anything. Yeah, when you feel deluded uh, in any way, and the delusion, you can sometimes you can know that you are deluded. You can feel that your mind is kind of uh, slightly unstable or confused or uh, it doesn't have that clarity that you wish you would have. Uh, yeah, this can happen sometimes. Uh, and uh, that is how sometimes you can be aware of the asava, the defilement of ignorance. Uh, but uh, in general, I would say the first two are the most important ones. Uh, most of the defilements are there. And uh, the very first one, the, defilement of sensual desire or attachment to the sensory things of the world, uh, that is by far the most important ones, and really the one that we probably should focus on the most. Uh, and you could even go deeper. You could say that uh, ill will, yeah, ill will is really an aspect of sensual desire, because when you are in the sensual realm, uh, an ill will tends to arise. Uh, it's kind of what, very interesting, isn't it? That when you are in that sensual, sens sensory realm, uh, we desire things of the world, but we can't have those things. Aversion arises and sometimes it will arise as a consequence. It is almost as if the desire for the sensory things of the world are completely interlinked with ill will and anger and aversion and these things. You cannot really separate them. So that is where so much of the work is to be done. Anyway, we'll come to that later on. So if these things are growing in your mind, these three asavas, then you have a problem, yeah? You should not pay attention to these things. And it's not so much paying attention, it's, it's the way we pay attention, yeah? If you pay attention in a certain way, that is when the problem arises. You can look at a person and you can desire that person. You can have aversion towards that person 
or you can have meta and equanimity towards that person, the same person, and it all depends on how you attend on that person. That is the only thing. It's not about what you attend to so much as how you attend it. And this is one of those very uh, kind of significant things to understand in the uh, development of mind. And the opposite, you have what are the things to which they do not pay attend but should. They are the things that when attention is paid to them do not give rise to unarisen defilements uh, and give up arisen defilements. Uh, the defilement of sensual desire, desire to be reborn or desire to exist, uh, and the defilement of ignorance or delusion. Uh, these are the things to which they do not pay attention. but should yeah so this is a way of paying attention that uh, overcomes existing defilements and stops existing defilements to arise yeah so this is uh, the opposite of the previous one uh, this is understanding the defects in those things uh, the danger in the ill will the defects in the sensory world the danger of the i am idea because the i am idea always brings with it attachments and as long as you have attachments uh, you are basically asking for suffering that's what attachments do uh, because attachments will be challenged by nature uh, yeah so uh, in brief you then change your perspective uh, and you look at this thing in a different way uh. so we talk about some of these uh, details later on but now i want to get into exactly what is going on here yeah so, uh, because of paying attention to what they should not, uh, and not paying attention to what they should, uh, unarisen defilements arise, uh, and arisen defilements grow. This is how you attend improperly. This is how you attend unwisely. Uh. So, so far, we have been looking at the idea of improper attention or unwise attention in a fairly normal way, the idea of thinking about morality, thinking about giving up the danger uh, in the permanent things of the world, yeah, and that is very, very important, uh, but now we're going to dive in to the deep, yeah, what it means to attend improperly when it comes to the higher kind of wisdom on the path. Uh, so this is, for that reason, very fascinating, and now we're talking about the really deeper things. Uh, but what will uh, uh, be of interest to every one of you is that even though this is deep, uh, at the same time, it can also be used in a practical way. Every one of these little things we're going to look at now has a practical aspect, uh, things that we can use in our own, uh, in our own lives. Yeah? And when you read this, it may seem quite strange, but uh, when I explain it, I think you will start to understand how this can be used. Uh, so this is how you attend improperly, yeah? Did I exist in the past? Did I not exist in the past? What was I in the past? How was I in the past? After being what, what did I become in the past? Will I exist in the future? Will I not exist in the future? Will I be in the future? What will I be in the future? How? Will I be in the future? After being what, what will I become in the future? Or they are undecided about the present. Thus, am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? This sentient being, where did it come from? And where will it go? So does any one of you think like this? <laughs> so you, maybe you don't recognize exactly what is going on here, but I guarantee you that every one of you has been thinking like this one way or another, because this is the wrong way of attending. And if you didn't think like this, the only way that is possible, if, it, if you were already an Arya, yeah, if you were already knew the teaching of the Buddha, I can guarantee you that you have already been thinking like this many times. So. So let me show you how it is that we think differently and by understand, think wrongly. And by understanding how we miss the point and we attend improperly, you can actually start to see how you can redirect your mind and think in a different way. Yeah? 
So I'm starting off here with did I exist in the past? Please stay where you were, uh, while yet. Uh, because we're going to continue with that paragraph. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> did I exist in the past? Uh, did I not exist in the past? Yeah, this is like the uh, uh, the beginning. And what that means, uh, you can imagine it means something it is especially relevant for past lives. Uh, so, it, it, you know, these are the sort of things that uh, have I been around in samsara for a long time? And did I have past lives or just arise out of nothing in this particular existence? Uh, and this is closely related to the uh, uh, typical views of the world that people have, yeah, the typical views of the uh, eternalist view that we have been going on for a long time in the past prior to this existence. Uh, or we just came into existence in this particular life. So, for example, if you did exist in the past, it probably probably means that you believe in karma or rebirth. You know, you've been coming from some deep past uh, somewhere before. Now, if you did not exist in the past, uh, it could mean that maybe you think you were created by a god. So, if a god creates you, then of course you came into existence in this life, uh, and you didn't exist before that. Uh, or you could be an atheist, yeah? an atheist thinking that, well, just randomly, we kind of arose in this life, and then when we die, we are kind of finished again after that. Uh, so this is the way that the world tends to think about these things, yeah? I'm sure every one of you has occasionally thought like that, yeah? You know, where did I come from? Was I created by God? Should I be a Christian? Should I be a Muslim? Should I be a Buddhist? Should I be an atheist? Uh, what is the right view about these things? Yeah, we all think about that sometimes because it is so. Um, I don't know. It is very close to us somehow. Yeah, it has to do with the sense of I am, who we are as beings, and because it has to do with the sense of I am, these questions naturally interest us because it is about me, and we are very close to ourselves, and we want to know about ourselves. But more importantly, is the next question: Yeah, what was I in the past? And I, every one of you probably has thought about that. Yeah, you think about your past uh, in this life, and you think about oh, before you know, I was not what you were before. Before I was, maybe you came from a poor family, and you have made a good living in this life, and now you are more wealthy. Or maybe you started out like a simple person, and you got an education, and now you are an education. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe you started out wealthy, and now you are poor. <laughs> I don't know what happens. Yeah, these things happen to everyone. Uh, or you started out in a certain social position, yeah, and now you're in a different social position. Uh, and you think about yourself in the past. Uh, and sometimes we take pleasure in that past. Sometimes we are not so, sometimes we are maybe ashamed of our past because we did stupid things. Uh, and sometimes we take pleasure in our past. We think, wow, in the past, everything was so wonderful. And now it has gone down, yeah, and now I feel much worse than I was in the past. Or the other way around, in the past everything was very uh, simple and basic, I was nothing really in the past, and now I am much better. Yeah. So we, either we delight in the past, yeah, we think back and we, if you are an educated person, maybe sometimes you think back to the degree that you have taken, or if you belong to a certain family, you take this pride in being part of that family, or whatever it is. In this way, we delight in the past sometimes. We think how things were wonderful, and sometimes, by comparison, we think the present is bad. And because we think the present is bad, we tend to go back into the past, delighting in that, holding on to that. And um, this can be very problematic. For example, uh, you know, if you are, if you meditate, for example, then very often in meditation, you have to let go of so much of your sense of identity. You cannot really hold on to the past in a meditation because uh, if you think about the past, then it's going to stop your peace, it's going to stop your stillness. You can't do anything about it. And the Buddha specifically says that to be able to meditate deeply, we have to let go of this kind of thinking thinking about your relations, about your country, about your reputation, and very much, almost all of that is about the past. Yeah, if you think about your country or your family or your reputation, it's always about the past because right here and now you have no reputation. In the present moment, there is no reputation. The reputation is all about what you did before. Yeah, so all the past stuff tends to hinder us. We 
with the more we hold on to the past, the more we think about what we was, what we were in the past, the more difficult it is to be peaceful in the present moment. Because in the present moment, you can only be peaceful if you let go of that. The mind will tend to hold on to these things, will tend to think about them if they are very important to you. But it's not just about what we were in this life. Sometimes people get obsessed about past lives as well. And uh, I'm sure you have all heard about the past life regressions. Uh, and sometimes people, they go to the past life regressionist, yeah, and they want to figure out who they were in the past life. And the uh, regressionist kind of, you know, takes, hypnotizes you, ding, 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 and you start thinking about your past life and all of these kind of things, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then sometimes it is very powerful. Sometimes maybe you will recall something from the past. And then you say something, and then when you cut out, you know, uh, you, your hypnotist or your past life regressionist will tell you what happened. And some very often you will say, yeah, in the past life, you were someone very famous and very uh, spectacular and some, someone, someone very special. And, uh, you know, you were Cleopatra in past life or some kind of emperor of China or Julius Caesar or something, <clears throat> something very powerful and astonishing. And you think, wow, that's really cool. And that is how the past life regression is how they make their money. That's how they become famous. So, because everyone falls into these traps, you know, and they say, wow, this past life regression is really good. They were able to tell me I was an emperor in the past life. Whoa, that must be the best. And then I can charge you more for the next uh, therapy session. This is just a way of uh, using, <laughs> using their uh, clients to, to make money. Sometimes, not always perhaps, but sometimes it is like that. Huh? And uh, you should always be suspicious of that, yeah, because the majority of people in this world uh, what have we been in the past life? We have been very ordinary people, and maybe peasants working in the fields. Yeah? Sometimes we would die very young because illnesses in past centuries were very strong and very, uh, there was no treatment. The doctors had very rudimentary, rudimentary medicines and things. And it was very difficult to be very, a lot of people died young, they died in childhood, they died very early on, they died in childbirth, they died in all of these ways that we don't really die anymore. Now. So the past is not as spectacular as we think it is. Uh, yeah? And so past usually is very ordinary, it is usually very boring, there's usually nothing there that, that is of interest in the past. Uh, the more you look into the past, especially look into the past lives, so it's just a uh, um, um, very humdrum and not something that actually would give you a sense of self in a positive way. So when we look at the past, remember that uh, uh, the past actually is uh, not usually all that interesting. We think that it is interesting, we think that it will give us a sense of self, but when we understand the past in this long term, especially looking into past lives uh, and seeing how you have always kind of moved around very often living very simple lives, uh, very often having a lot of suffering in those lives because uh, life has often been very hard. Just look at human history of the planet uh, and often been very difficult. Uh, when you look at the big picture of things, uh, you realize the past actually is very, very uninteresting. Uh, there's nothing there to hold on to. Uh, there's nothing there really apart from more problems, uh, more difficulties, uh, more suffering. Uh, and the more uh, clear here about that, all these problems in the world, the, the more you can let go of the past, also the past in this life. If you think that your past in this life is very interesting because maybe that you have an interesting past, remember that even if that is the case, the moment you die, you get reborn, very quickly you will, uh, you will, not, will not remember yourself what you were in this life. And very quickly, Everything that were in this life uh, will be forgotten by everybody. Uh, even the people in this world who are remembered the longest, uh, yeah, people like the Buddha, who was remembered for two and a half thousand years, uh, even the Buddha will eventually disappear in the mist of history, uh, gone forever, never to be seen again. Uh, yeah, it's the same with everyone. Uh, uh, we are remembered maybe for a generation or two by our children, maybe by our grandchildren, uh, and then we are lost. Uh, and nothing from our past will ever be remembered again. The past is so trivial. The past is so irrelevant. There's nothing there to hold on to. 
everything in your life will be forgotten uh, within a very, very short time after you pass away. Yeah? So think about this in the right way. Yeah? Don't take an interest in the past, which actually is not really all that interesting at all. Yeah? And when you do that, you can release your ego, release your sense of self from these things, which actually are very relevant in a, in a, in a sense. Then there is, how was I in the past? And this is another way of thinking, similar kind of way of thinking. What was I in the past is more about your status, yeah, maybe education or family status and these kind of things. And how was I in the past? More kind of thinking about the emotions or the feelings that you had in the past. Were you a happy person? Were you a miserable person? Yeah, and that too you can attach to. You can attach to that feelings that you're having. Oh, no, in the past, I was so happy. Now I'm so, I became a Buddhist. I became so miserable because after I became a Buddhist, everything took up. Everything is suffering. But in the past, oh, when I was still ignorant, then I was really happy. <laughs> Something like that, right? And, uh, uh, but uh, remember, this is exactly as unreliable as the idea of the steps. So how we have were in the past, or maybe you are the opposite. Maybe in the past, you were suffering after you became a Buddhist, you understood much more about happiness, and now you are hopefully on the right track, being more happy than you were before. So you look back into the past, you see, there's nothing there to hold on to. It is just this wave of emotions going back yeah, endlessly into the past, but there is nothing there that is really worthwhile of attaching to. And before you know it, that too will be forgotten, that too will have disappeared into the mist of the history. And it's nothing that you can actually uh, carry with you into the future. No? The more idea we have of the past, the longer we can remember, no? uh, especially if you take into account past life, so the more clearly you can see how it is all changing, always moving around, uh, nothing to be held on to, no? just cause and conditions moving on yeah, from the past uh, into the future. No? So uh, then we have the uh, after being what. Uh, what did I become in the past? Yeah. And uh, th this is perhaps the idea that uh, you, you were something and then you changed. Yeah. And one way of interpreting this that I like is the idea that we often we see ourselves as starting out at a certain point. Yeah. I was there, then I used my willpower, I used all my intelligence and my energy. I worked really, really hard and after working really, really hard, I built up my life and I've made myself into what now? I'm a self-made person. Yeah, look at me. Through my own intelligence, through my own sweat, through my own hard work, I've built up this existence and I'm so proud of myself because I made all of these things. And this is a delight in the sense of the doer. Yeah, I am the doer in my life, the creator. I create, I've created this wonderful existence for myself. We're delighting in the creator. We're attaching to this idea of being someone who actually creates something positive in the world. But again, this is another delusion. Yeah, this is a maybe in this life, uh, you know, you have had some kind of success. Uh, but I love that story, and I, I told that story everywhere when I give this kind of retreats. And this is the story of one of these people who did have a past life regression. And it was a very powerful past life regression, whereby he remembered the kind of person he was in the past life, and then in great detail with name and families and addresses and where he came from, where he developed, and all of these kind of things. And, and he took details and he found that such a person had actually existed. So I'm quite sure that he had, you know, he became very clear about rebirth after that. But uh, what was interesting for him was that he was very proud exactly in this way for what he had done in this life. Because in this life, he felt that he had worked very hard, he had built up a business, he was very successful, and he was very proud about that uh, until. He remembered his past life. And when he remembered his past life, he realized he was exactly the same kind of personality. Yeah, he was someone who worked really, really hard, built up a successful career for himself, and had success as a consequence of that. And when he saw that, he realized that actually it had nothing to do with him. 
it was not he, he who was using his creative abilities to create a happy existence. It was just a habit. It was part of his conditioning that he was a person. He didn't have a choice. He had to work hard. Yeah? It was almost as if this was a uh, kind of a personality trait that had been built into him over long, long periods of time, maybe life after life. And now when he came to this life, it wasn't as if he was choosing to work really hard, but he was actually conditioned to work hard. He had no choice. He was programmed to work hard. He was like a robot carrying out a problem that had been written in the past. And this is the right way to think about things. Instead of thinking about ourselves as successful or as a failure for that, that's the kind of reverse, yeah, being a failure. Never think like that. It is not really your fault or your, um, you know, your, uh, the opposite of fault, your um, whatever it is, success, yeah. You, you, you don't succeed because it is your benefit or whatever, you don't fail because it is your fault. You, uh, these things come from programs written in the past. Uh, and uh, when you understand that, it becomes actually very attractive. Uh, it becomes like you are trapped rather than you are succeeding because of your uh, willpower or your, uh, you know, your creative power or whatever it is. Uh, so this is another wrong idea. After being what, what did I become in the past? Uh, yeah? It is not about you. It is about just a process happening. Uh, and you happen to be in that process. And so these things happen to you as a consequence. And once you understand that, you don't identify so much with being the doer. You don't identify with being the creator. You don't become so proud because you are successful. Nor do you become depressed or despondent because you are not successful. You realize all of these things are just cause and conditions. And it has very often nothing at all to do with you. You are trapped and you're just playing out that program that was written somewhere in the past. So this is how we think about the past, yeah? Or think about in the past in terms of what I was, which has to do with the ego. Yeah, I was great in the past. How I was, how you felt, oh, in the past, I felt really good, yeah? It was, it was great. Or maybe everything was bad, yeah? Either way, yeah? Or we think about the past in terms of the self, in terms of the self of doing, the doer, the building up. There are like three ways that are kind of mentioned here, yeah? three ways of un understanding what is going on in this particular sutta. And then we have a very similar, similar idea about the future and about the present. You know, the future is very much the same thing. Will I, first of all, will I exist in the future? Will I not exist in the future? This obviously has to do with whether we survive after death or not. Yeah? So maybe you are, if you are a materialist or you are an atheist, maybe you think you will just die and that will be the end of things. And if you are a Buddhist, you think you will get reborn. If you are a Christian or a Muslim, you think you might go to heaven. Yes, that's a kind of a future existence. All of these things, yeah? this is kind of the basic ideas. And of course, everyone is interested in these things. Everyone has an idea about this. Yeah, everyone has thought. Most people have thought about these things. If we haven't thought about these things, we certainly have thought of what will I be in the future? Yeah, we have all uh, fantasized about the future, about what kind of relationships we have, about what kind of status we have, especially the status of whether it's going to be high status or low status, educated or uneducated. And all of these kind of things, this is kind of hardwired into human beings and everyone really. And we, and again, it's a similar, almost exactly the same, same thing as what was I in the past, but now projected onto the future instead. So this uh, idea, this um, uh, uh, fantasy about where we think we might be going and how that relates to me. Yeah, I want to be great. I want to be something special. I want my ego to be satisfied, yeah, and moving on into the future. Then we have how will I be in the future, which is a very similar kind of idea. How will I be is about how we will feel in the future, yeah. Will I be rich to enjoy all the sensory pleasures of the world, or will I maybe be poor? Yeah, we have a certain vision about the future again. 
And we are concerned about this. Sometimes we are anxious. The anxiety comes from the fear that maybe we will fail. Yeah? Or maybe we will be poor. Or maybe we will be someone who is really um, uh, uh, very unknown in the future. So no one cares about the ego will not succeed. And that's where anxiety comes from. The fear about the future that we will not be able to live up to a certain standard or have a certain degree of happiness. Or it can be the opposite. Then we look at the future, yeah, in the future, if I work hard, I will have success. Then we think about the future in a positive way. It's the opposite of anxiety is looking at the future with some degree of, yay, the future is marvelous. And then again, the idea of after being what I might become in the future. Again, the idea of if I work hard now, if I apply the doer in this life, if I uh, identify with the doer and I do the right thing, I will become something marvelous. It's the gratification of the agency inside, it, gratification of the act of doing it. And all of this is, is problematic. It's problematic because it strengthens the ego, the strength and the sense of I. Uh, the more we think about these things, we will take that thinking process with us into the meditation. Yeah? And if you look at meditation, it is very often thinking about the future. How can I solve my problems? How can I deal with certain things? Or we fantasize about things. It can be a fantasy about sensual pleasures. Uh, that fantasy, in a sense, is always about the future. Yeah? Because uh, the sensual pleasures are something you may be hoping to get or could also be about the past, of course. So uh, these things, the more we indulge in these things, uh, the more we uh, tend to stop us in being peaceful and stop us from having success in meditation practice. Uh, so how can we deal with that? How can we stop this? And again, it's about realizing that the future actually is not very interesting. Uh, in the future, we think about greatness, we think about success, uh, but really, the future is always just more of the same. It's more of the same kind of problems. And even if you are successful, so what? It's not a big deal. You will still have problems. Life will still be largely be the same. And if you have success, there will be many um, problems that come with the success. Yeah, maybe you become more attached to your uh, all your possessions or all the things that you are successful with. Uh, sometimes you see how the rich, the really wealthy, how they hide away behind gated communities uh, because they are afraid of the world around them. Uh, sometimes when you're wealthy, you become more afraid. Uh, yeah, become becomes more problematic. Uh, and anyway, you still have the same problems. You still have the same problems in relationships. Uh, you still have the uh, many of the same problems of old age and sickness, uh, all of these things are still there. The future isn't very interesting yet. In fact, if you look beyond this life, the fact that we are going to die and we're going to have to give up everything in this world, uh, in a sense, it's almost as if we don't have a future. Uh, the future that we have is just so uh, utterly uncertain. Yeah? When we die into future existence, uh, if we're going to ensure that that future existence is good, uh, well, thinking about it is the last thing that we should do because the way we create a good future in a future life is actually by being peaceful now, by being kind now, by coming into the present moment and by living mindfully and wisely. That is how we create that uh, positive future, not thinking about it. If you think about it, all you're doing is trying to resolve problems that are going to come again and again and again and never finding a solution because there's always more problems over the horizon. Yeah. So the future is not interesting. Yeah. We're not going anywhere. There's nowhere to go. In fact, the only place to go is in on the spiritual path uh, to peace, to more morality, towards kindness, uh, towards all of these kind of things. That is the place to go. And that going happens now in the present moment, not thinking about the future. Yeah. So forget about the future. I mean, all our thoughts, all our fantasies turn out to be empty, turn out to be hollow. Right? Remember the famous Buddha, the simile of the dream. The other Buddha talks about the dream about the future. Right? The future is like uh, uh, you dream about something. You think about, you know, how beautiful things can be in the dream, or beautiful towns, beautiful landscapes, beautiful people. Everything is so marvelous. Right? And then you wake up in the morning and it's all gone. 
And that is how our dreams about the future very often are. They're like a dream, yeah? We think about the future when we are young or we dream about relationships. We think the relationship is going to be like this. I'm going to have success like that. Uh, but the reality of getting the things is often is completely different from the dream about the things. Uh, it is much less satisfying. Yeah? We think that getting things are going to be satisfying, especially that trap comes with relationships yeah we think relationships are going to be satisfying this is kind of part of the delusion of relationships but then when we get into them they turn out not to be all that satisfying there is a downside to these things so there's nothing there to be found and i love this kind of contemplation sometimes you know in meditation practice we can tell you this mantra yeah i have no future and by saying I have no future, what it means is not that there isn't the future, but that the future is not interesting yet. There's nothing there that is really exciting. The exciting stuff happens in the present moment, it happens now, not to all of these things that we normally think about. Yeah? And then you can let go of some of that future. Yeah? So you can see how these contemplations, they help us to overcome this uh, um, tendency to always think about the past or think about the future. Yeah, if you look at your meditation, you look at the problems that we often have with becoming still and becoming peaceful, people always say that uh, uh, thinking is the, one of the biggest problems they have. Some people have sloth and torpor and tiredness is one of the biggest problems. Uh, but for many people, thinking is the biggest problem. And this is where that thinking arises. Uh, yeah? And this is how we actually think wrongly, according to the Buddha. All of this is improper attention. It is unwise attention. It just builds up more of the sense of self. It builds up this delusion that there was something there in the past worthy of thinking about, that there is something there in the future worthy of thinking about, when really it is just an illusion. And there's nothing there really of any interest whatsoever. Then we come to the last one, which is about the present moment, yeah? Uh, am I? Am I not? Uh, what am I? How am I? Yeah, am I? Am I not? This is again about this idea of uh, uh, eternalism or annihilationism. Am I means here, am I in a real sense? Do I have a core? Do I have a soul which will carry on into the future? Uh, Am I not just means that I am just this compound. I, you know, when I die, everything will disappear. This is the idea. Am I not? So very similar to the two previous ones. What am I? Yeah, what am I now? What is my status? Do, am I important? I'm a Buddhist monk. Surely I am really, maybe I'm really important because I'm a Buddhist monk. Yeah. Or maybe you think you are very important. Yeah, you have maybe you have some kind of status with matters or educational background, or you, you have double, triple PhD in, in various things, and you're really proud of that. Uh, or maybe, how am I? Again, you think that now I'm happy. I've finally found the solution to happiness. Uh, you know what it's like sometimes you have a good meditation and think, yeah, now I understand how meditation works. Uh, and of course you don't, because next time you sit down to meditate, you can't do it again. Yeah, you can't go back into that meditation. So again, this idea, how am I, is this illusion that you are, uh, you know, now you have found happiness, you understand what it is. What am I? The illusion of status again. Uh, and then this uh, uh, sentient being, where did it come from? Where would it go? The, again, the idea that we are in charge of destiny, that we are creators of our future, uh, and also creators of our present through our agency. So uh, even your present moment, yeah, who you are now, what you are now, where you're going to, even all of that, you let it go because you realize that all of that too is conditioned. It has come into existence because of a certain way of things coming together. That is why you are who you are now. It, is, it feels like we have done these things. It feels like we are responsible now. But the more you look at that, you realize, actually, I'm not really all that responsible at all. It has happened through uh, the, my family in this life, the schooling I've had, all the people I've met in this world. Uh, and also, of course, through uh, the kind of conditioning I've had in past lives also has made me who I am now. Uh, 
And because of that, I can't really take any credit. Uh, yeah, this is just the state that I find myself in. Uh, why am I a Buddhist monk? Is it because I am, you know, really uh, smart or I, I found the meaning of life? Or is it just because I am full of habit from the past? Uh, and uh, the truth is, I, I think I'm a Buddhist monk largely because I'm just following a habit. Uh, it's not my fault. I can't take any credit uh, for being a Buddhist monk. Uh, yeah, it is just what, what happens to you if you do things in a certain way. And uh, that is kind of nice. Yeah, nice not to take that too seriously because uh, it means that you don't make an eye out of the fact of being a Buddhist monk. Yeah. You are just a person wearing funny clothes and we're having a shaven head. Apart from that, you're just like everyone else. It is not such a big deal there. So you let go, even your present identity, yeah, you try to let it go because the more you let go of that, uh, the less importance you place on this thing, which is our identity, who I am, who I was, who I will be, the easier it is to be a good person. Because as long as there is identity, you will tend to somehow react to that identity. If people challenge you, you will become upset. And also, it will block you, as I mentioned before, in your meditation practice. But uh, let's move on. So that is the passage of how you attend improperly. And when you attend improperly in this way, then something happens. And what happens is that the following six views arise in that person and they are taken as a genuine factor. And these six views, they are not all uh, they are not all mutually incompatible. You can have many of these views at the same time because they can kind of work together. But let's just quickly have a look at these views. Yeah, the first uh, one view, myself exists in an absolute sense. The view, myself does not exist in an absolute sense. The view, I perceive self with self. The view I perceive what is not self with the self. The view I perceive the self with what is not self. Or they have such a view, the self of mine is the one who speaks and feels and experiences the results of good and bad deeds in all the different realms. This self is permanent, everlasting, eternal, and imperishable, and will last forever and forever. So uh, if you think wrongly, like we have just said, I'll stop there, we'll come back to the last part afterwards. Uh, yeah. And if you think, if you contemplate like we did before, you pay unwise attention, eventually it builds up into views, yeah? how we perceive the world, how we attend to the world, attend whether it's rightly or wrongly, it builds up our entire mental, um, a mental kind of uh, reality, yeah, including the views that we have and the thinking that we have, and all of these things are built up out of these perceptions uh, and these ways of thinking to the world. So these are the views that arise from this kind of wrong uh, attention. Yeah, myself exists in an absolute sense. Uh, this is the view that uh, I truly exist. When I die, I will carry on forever and ever, either through rebirth or through uh, hanging out with God if you are a Christian, or, or whatever else it is, or hanging out with Brahma if you are a Hindu, yeah, there's this idea of a permanence. And of course, a very large part of the world, they have precisely this kind of humor. Yeah? I exist in an absolute sense. And maybe we do too, we are Buddhists. And in one way, maybe we understand that this is the wrong view, but deep down, that view may still be there. As long as we have a sense of self, remember, as long as you have a sense of self, there will be a distortion in your outlook. Yeah? And you are very likely to have this kind of view, yeah, to some extent. Maybe not absolutely, but to some extent, it will still be there. Because only when you become a stream enter is it possible to abandon these views completely. Yeah? So we are trapped to some degree by this uh, uh, sense of self. Yeah? We cannot really step out of that. Uh. So this is one view that arises. The, eternalist view that comes from this. Yeah? Then the alternative is that my view does not exist in an absolute sense. And this means that uh, 
when I die, I will pass away. Yeah, this will be the end of it. In other words, he, he was saying the two views that you see the Buddha talking about the world, how the world always thinks either you exist forever or you, when you die, you pass away, and that is the end of things. So, and when you think about it, this is exactly how the world thinks. Yeah. And this is why this is so powerful because you can recognize the Buddha is here, understands very exactly how the world thinks about this thing. And if you look at the world, you will see the Buddha is right. Yeah, if you look at the, uh, almost in all religions, whether it's uh, Christianity or Hinduism or Islam uh, and many other religions as well, they have the view of eternalism. When you die, you go to a heavenly realm and you carry on there. Yeah, or you have this eternal round of rebirth, and eventually you get refined from that rebirth. Alternatively, and this is also quite a common view in our world, is the idea that when you die, then you stop. Yeah? And the Buddha said, and this is what is so powerful about this, the Buddha realized that this, all of these views, they come from the sense of self inside. They are derived from improper attention, unwise attention. That is where they come from. And this is what makes the Buddhist teach so radical, yeah, so extraordinary. It actually goes beyond these two views that are everywhere in the world. And what is that alternative view of the Buddha? And for those of you who have heard some of these teachings before, you will know that that alternative view is dependent origination. Dependent origination is the middle way between the self existing absolutely and the self not existing at all, coming to an end. That is dependent origination. And if you want to hear a beautiful sutta that talks about that, it is the uh, Kachanagota Sutta found in the uh, you know, Connected Discourses of the Buddha, the second book, the 12th chapter, the chapter on causation, Sutta number 15, yeah, SN 1215, and it talks precisely about this and it expands on this. But you can see how the Buddha has seen the world very clearly because this is exactly how the world thinks about things. And we know that because that is exactly how the world thinks about things now in the present day. It is really only the Buddhist teaching that stands out for finding a middle way between these things. And then we have more. Actually, we do have more views, but um, I think a bit over, overly excited here. I think now we need to we should really have a break and to have a, give everyone a chance just to uh, stretch your legs or, or go to the toilet or have a drink or whatever you like. So uh, please have a short break, uh, 15 minutes, and we'll be back again at uh, 1.45.